Well, we're going to get started. I want to welcome each of you here tonight. Thank you for being with us. And uh, we'll have a few more, I'm sure, come in. And uh, I'm sure, I'm, we're not sure how many this might have affected that could come to the plaza, plaza on 17th but can't come all the way out here. I know that there are a couple folks at the south end of the county who said they probably wouldn't be able to make it at night. And, uh, but hopefully, uh, as the word gets out, this is going to even grow. So that's a good thing. And I want to welcome those who are watching us tonight by live stream. We welcome you to the service. And we always do a Thursday night Bible study, verse by verse. Uh, right now, we're in 1 Samuel. If you want to open your Bibles, we're in 1 Samuel. And uh, the title of this, this study is The Kings. And we're learning life lessons from the good and the bad in the kings that God raised up or the kings that served Israel and later even Israel and Judah. Uh, so uh, tonight we'll be picking up at chapter 24. And before we get started, let me say, uh, we've, we've only opened this, this, I guess it's the north parking area, not the east parking area. Did anybody have a problem with that tonight? You did? You had to go around, you went around and around to find it. It is hard to get in here. You can see all these cars, but how do you get to them? You know, that's the problem. Uh, folks, uh, there's still a couple places here. Feel free. And we'll, Richard, we might need to pull another table over just in case some folks come in. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a table in the back, too. You can sit there, Ani. Yeah. I want to pull you out. And uh, so, so right now we're only opening the one parking area or the gate, but we're willing to do both if people will use it. Would it be better for you if we did both? Uh, some of you are more familiar with the uh, other entrance. Richard? It's easier to keep an eye on all the cars and stay on one side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So we'll continue with what we're doing tonight. That sounds good. Well, let's go ahead if we can and, uh, and get started. It is kind of neat to know that tonight uh, we have children on campus. We have our student ministry on campus. We're all in the same location. Uh, Brenton and I and Deb and uh, Pastor Ray uh, and, and uh, uh, who else? We, the elders, but also, uh, uh, yes, Sherry, that's right, Sherry Frazier, our children's minister. Uh, we've discussed maybe even starting together with a couple songs and then break into our groups, just to take advantage of the fat fact that we're all together as a family tonight. Uh, one of the things, somebody asked me coming in, why are we doing this? Did something happen at the plaza that we can't use it on Thursday nights? No, not at all. We, we still have access to that. The, the idea is that there would be a night when we can all come together. We're starting to provide children's ministry midweek, Thursday night, and this also affords parents who drop the children off to stay for the Bible study and then walk right out and get their kids and go home. It makes it easy. As opposed to dropping a child off here, driving across town to the plaza, you'd never get there in time. And then you'd have to be back here by, you know, whatever time, uh, 7.45, 8 o'clock, whatever it is. It would just be too hard. So this allows for families to be part as well. So thank you for... Uh, being willing to adapt and to, to adjust your schedules to be part of this. We're, we're just glad that you're here. Well, let's go ahead if we can and begin with prayer, and then we'll get into the Word of God tonight. Uh, Father, tonight as we come, uh, it, one of the easiest things to do is take the Bible, read it, and then try to figure out what we think it means. And, and, and we always seem when we do that, we filter your Word through our own experience. We filter it through our own pass through our own way of thinking, our own uh, morals and values. But Lord, that doesn't necessarily give us the right perspective of that passage. And so tonight, Lord, we didn't come to share our ideas and get our opinions heard. Tonight, we, we've gathered to let you speak. We want your opinion on this, this truth. And so use uh, the Kings again tonight and the life of David to Teach us the things that are difficult to hear and learn and also to, to help us to line up with uh, who you are and what you've called us to do and be. 
And we just give you praise that you're a God that loves us and loves us so much that you are constantly honing us, constantly working on us, chipping away so that we would conform to the image of Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we're at chapter 24. and Let me just read for you verses 1 and 2 and 3. Uh, when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats' rocks. Uh, and he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost part of the cave. So let's just get the picture here, if I can give just a little background. It's always important when we study the Bible to not just read what's happening in the text at face value, but try to understand the context, what's behind, what's with, what comes alongside what we're reading. And so the best place to begin on that is to look at the past. What's, what would set this up? Why does it say when Saul returned from following the Philistines? Well, if you remember from our study a couple weeks ago in chapter 23, Saul and his men were closing in on David. They had hunted them down. Saul, obviously, a, being controlled by an evil spirit, wanting to take David's life. And uh, you say, well, and, and, and the evil spirit was from the Lord, it says. Uh, all God did was, was give to Saul what was already determined in his heart. He was bent towards evil. His flesh was ruling him. Saul was never close to the Lord, was never in devotion with God, was never leaning upon God in his leadership of Israel. Uh, uh, so he just basically wanted David out of the way because I'm on the throne and I don't want anybody to be a threat to my throne. And so he was coming after David. And so, but, but what happened was, uh, while he had closed in on David, literally, he was going to get him. I mean, he was going to capture David. And, and providentially, God sent a messenger to Saul as he was closing in. And he, the message was, hey, the Philistines are attacking the land. And so Saul lifted his, his uh, you know, surge on David and turned it towards the Philistines. And he left, and now he's come back after dealing with the, Pharise with the Philistines, following the Philistines. Now he's pursuing David again. Now, here in chapter 24, uh, it's interesting. Where, where David's hiding out, where he's hanging out, is in a very hot area. The temperature in that region can reach 120 degrees. It's like stepping into an oven. And so that's why it says that Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. He was trying to get out of the sun, and he was also resting. And, and so he's pursuing David, he's tired, he's probably still tired from the Philistine fights, and so he goes into a cave to rest, not knowing that David's in the same cave, only he and his men are very deep in the cave. And that's the picture we have here. And the men of David said, verse 4, to him, to David, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. So we have David's men, probably his advisors, those who are close to him, who are telling David, this is a God-given opportunity for you to take care of Saul. He's been pursuing you. He's used manipulation to try and ruin you. He has thrown spears at you. He's not a very good spear thrower because he threw at least three spears and missed him each time. Or David's just really agile. I don't know what, what the truth, probably a little bit of both. And, and so his men are saying, look, this is our chance. Let's take David out. But it's interesting here that David doesn't knee jerk in his response. In other words, David isn't going to return evil for evil. And that's what Saul's men are asking him to do. David possessed godly wisdom, and, and as we read this story, it really comes out. There is so much in this for us to learn from, okay? So let me give you a passage of Scripture. Write this down. Let me just read it for you. 
Isaiah 28, verse 16. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes in the Lord will not be in haste. If you're going to follow me, if you're going to follow and allow me to be your Lord, you will not respond hastily. Even when it appears that I've given you the opportunity, take it. And see, that's the problem. In our flesh, it's hard to discern whether God really is telling us to go forward, even though that door seems to have opened. And, 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 and you know, I don't know about you, I would say it's got to be true for most people. The hardest thing about walking in relationship with God is waiting on the Lord. Would you agree? Because, yeah, man, you know, we're, we're praying, we're asking for whatever it is, and we want it now. And so I prayed last night. I don't understand why this morning the answer didn't come. God hasn't even spoken to me yet. I don't even feel like he's even paying attention. It's only been like eight hours. And here we are already frustrated with God. It's like a young man looking for a girlfriend, you know, but he wants a Christian girlfriend. And he prays before the Lord, Lord, please, I'm asking you, here are the things I want in a girlfriend. And I'm looking for a Christian girlfriend. And if you could provide her. And then like, you know, a month later, he goes to the pastor, pastor, I don't get God. I've been praying a whole month and God has not provided that girl. As if God's got to do it now. Well, that's not the way the Lord works. He's not interested in fulfilling His purposes in our timing. And He's certainly not willing to perform your purposes in your timing. So the hardest thing is, well, it's coupled with really knowing what the Lord is saying. I think that's also very difficult. To really know whether God is saying yes or no, and then is the timing, am I rushing this? Am I trying to get an answer before God's ready to give an answer? In this case, the soldiers were telling him, God's in this. Go take Saul out. And David's like, hmm, no, no, I, I'm not sensing that. I'm not going to do that. And I think there's something for us to learn in that. Uh, David's men thought this opportunity to kill Saul was God's blessing, when in reality, here's what it really was. And we'll see it as it plays out in the story. It was God's testing. God gave David an open door not to take Saul's life, but to test David to see if he was really willing and believing that this is God's business, not mine. And this is a wonderful test for a soon-to-be king, is will he act on his own or will he follow me? So God oftentimes in our lives presents an open door. It's not because he wants you to take it. Sometimes he's just testing you. Will you wait on me? An example would be for a guy. Okay, I'm a guy, so I'll, I, I think like a guy. So the guy's been wanting a boat for, you know, a year. And then all of a sudden, he gets this stimulus check in the mail. And he saves them all up. Look, the Lord's provided. God's in this. It's time for the boat. Really? Or is maybe God testing you? to see if you truly have a heart after him. And, and I think that's, there's a lesson in that for probably everybody in the room tonight. Uh, and you probably can look back in your life at the times when you didn't pass the test. I, I can. Times where I failed the test miserably. I think we need to be honest about that. Uh, but unless we wait on the Lord, what we thought would be a delight usually proves to be a disaster. Isn't that true? So waiting on God is the key. Uh, slow down. You say, I don't know how to wait. What does that mean? Well, slow down. Don't let people outside of you pressure you on the time or the timing. Go sit with the Lord. The best thing you can do is turn the stinking TV off and stop listening to sermons and stop listening to everything else and just go sit in the presence of God with your Bible. And open up the Word and just begin to meditate upon the Word of God. And what that'll do is slow you down. And oftentimes what I'll do is I'll journal while I'm 
while I'm reading. And, and so what I'm doing is I'm journaling, like I come to a passage and I read something, and I go, Lord, why did David wait so long? Why didn't he just react? I think I would have reacted. And I write it down. And when, when I write it down, what I'm doing, first of all, by writing, I'm slowing down. Because my mind would work a lot quicker than my hand can write. And secondly, what it does is it makes me contemplate. It makes me really think about it. And, and oftentimes, uh, I, I, I've never heard God speak audibly. Ever. Never. But I either get a sense of peace over what I sense the Scripture saying, or I don't get peace. And, but that whole process takes time. That is a good thing. Because now I'm not so quick to jump up and run and do what I thought I was going to do. And I can't tell you as a pastor the number of times that when I've counseled with people, and I absolutely am convinced that I, that I, I can help them, and I can see based on what they've told me what the right answer is. And yet the Lord would say to me, it's about timing. Don't share the right answer yet. I want them to come to a point to see the right answer. Don't bail them out. Don't fix them. Let them see it. And, and obviously when somebody else, when they begin to, you know, see it, it means something completely different because now they'll remember that and they'll grow from it as opposed to us trying to help them. We can do that with our kids, can't we? We see our kids heading for trouble. We know what the outcome will be. We just know. We've lived long enough to know. But sometimes the Lord says, I, I know. Just wait. Let them, they, they need a bump in the road. And God uses bumps in the road. We're going to see that tonight in the life of David big time. Okay? So verse 4, latter part of the verse, Then David arose and stealthily, cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So rather than take Saul's life, he takes just a corner of his robe, of his garment. Uh, David simply snipped the hem of Saul's robe. In, in those days, the border of a garment uh, was highly significant. Uh, it's actually called, if you want to write it down, the zit zit. Uh, T-Z-I-T, Z-I-T. Pretty simple to spell. T-Z-I-T, Z-I-T. In Hebrew, Z-Z-I-T. And what it means is it's like a tassel. It's like a, a special piece of the edge of the garment. And any Orthodox Jew wears a Z-Z-I-T today on his garment. Jesus wore a Z-Z-I-T in his day. Uh, he used to get on the Pharisees. Remember, he'd, he would get on the Pharisees for their white robes and their long tassels. They wore zit zits too, but they made theirs really long because they wanted people to think the longer your zit zit, the longer your tassel, the more spiritual you are. And Jesus would get on them for that. Wait, hang on a second. So, so that's what he cut off. He cut off that portion. Now, what's interesting, the zit zit, it says, uh, speak to the people of Israel. Uh, num- or, let me give you the passage. Numbers 15, 37, and 38. Write that down. Numbers 15, 37, 38. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. A a cord of blue. Why blue? Because blue was the reminder of heaven for, for for the Jew. And in fact, in the, you know, in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, that was a picture of heaven. That was a symbolic picture of heaven for the Jews. And so here, and then also, it's more than that. Uh, the blue hymn reminded the people of the commandments that their God gave them of, uh, from heaven, that God spoke from heaven with the commandments, gave them to Moses, and, uh, and they were to follow those. So the people tied to the fringes of their hymns, get this, uh, the Orthodox Jew would tie 613 knots on his garment because the rabbi in that day took the Ten Commandments and constituted 613 commands out of, out of ten. <laughs> they didn't make it easier, they made it a lot tougher. And so the people would wear the, you know, the tassels with 613 knots. And this is what David cut off. This is what David cut off. 
Now, the dye that they would use to make this blue color in the garment, in the tassel, uh, was from a snail in the sea. And it took, I mean, every snail could only give you just a tiny little drop of that blue ink. And so literally, they, it was so cost absorbent that it, if you had a little tiny bit of blue, you were probably the average uh, medium income Jew. If you saw a Jew and they would, the, the Pharisees would widen the tassel, all blue, which meant that they had a lot of money. That's how people knew you were wealthy, was you had more blue than others. And so who knows what Saul's garment looked like, but, but uh, that's what David came after. And something else is interesting here. In the Bible days, one could determine one's wealth by that. But, but if you go back to Ruth chapter 3 and verse 9, this is interesting to me. It was Ruth who said to Boaz, cover me. And what she was saying was, I want your garment. I want your family. I want your heritage to cover me, your wealth to cover me. That's what he covered her with. Okay? I want to come under the covering of your family pedigree. That's literally what she said to him. And so, so here, here Saul is with his pedigree. And David came up and snipped it which is a reminder the Lord has already said your days as king are numbered. Your pedigree is not going to always be in place. So there's twofold here. One is absolutely David did not want to take Saul's life and he snipped a piece of the garment in order to say to Saul, I could have killed you and I chose not to. But the other part is there's a little bit of a side message to Saul hidden away in this thing. Uh, in Revelation 19, we read that when Jesus returns, the title that he will wear on his garment is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, it'll be written high on his thigh, but it won't be a tattoo that he wears on his skin. It's literally on the garment. Uh, so the ZZ was and is an important part of the garment that the Orthodox Jew wears. Uh, Let's, let's continue here, if we can, in our text, because this gets really interesting to me. Uh, look, it's interesting that after David cut the garment, he didn't take his life, he just cut Saul's garment. And after that, David, his heart is struck uh, in, in such a unique way that he writes, verse 5, or it's recorded, and afterward David's, David's heart was, it struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. This is the same Saul who's out to kill David, who called David a dog. The same Saul who has manipulated in every way possible to set David up for the fall. The same Saul who has thrown spears at David. The same Saul who has tried to hunt David down and kill him. And yet David's response, he says, My heart is, is, is stricken. I shouldn't have even taken the hem of his garment. He is the Lord's anointed. Who am I to touch God's anointed? That is just, a, to me, a powerful, powerful image and there's much in that for us to learn. David's recognizing that anointing doesn't always imply deserving. Was Saul deserving of being spared? No. But he's anointed. Now let's just qualify, clarify quickly that this is in the Old Testament. This is before the Holy Spirit lived in the hearts of men and women who believed in God. That wouldn't happen until the day of Pentecost in the New Testament. This is a time when God would bring a special anointing upon someone for a purpose, a special purpose that God intended them to fulfill. So he would anoint the priest, he would anoint the prophet, 
He would anoint, anoint certain people, like in the judges that he would raise up. He would anoint kings. But he didn't just anoint everybody. So in that day, only those that God had given a special purpose to were anointed. And that's why Saul was anointed. Saul was anointed as the king. And David recognizes that. And David's like, who am I to touch God's anointed? It has nothing to do with whether he deserves it. I should never touch him. He's the anointed. We need to understand the role, church, even in this day of spiritual authority. I will tell you now, when someone says to me, oh, that's that person, they're such an anointed vessel. Um, you need to understand that that might be true, but it's not the whole truth. In the New Testament, the whole truth is every Christian is an anointed vessel. Did you know that? Did you know that the pastor's not the anointed vessel? Did you know that he's no more anointed than you are? He might, he's obviously called to a different role, but the Holy Spirit dwells inside the heart of every man. That's what would happen when the person was anointed, when David was anointed, when Saul was anointed. What does it say? It says the Spirit of God came upon him. When David was anointed, the Spirit of God came upon him from that day forward. What? The Spirit of the Lord? The same Spirit that now lives in you. There is no such thing in the New Testament as only certain people being anointed. That is a misunderstanding of Scripture. And it's, it's common, it happens, and I'm not belittling or berating those who, who believe that. They've not been taught. They've not seen it. But the reality is today, we're all anointed by God if we're saved. You need to see yourself that way. The same Holy Spirit that was in Billy Graham lives in you. Billy Graham was not special. Billy Graham was not great. Billy Graham took the Holy Spirit in him that's in you, and he allowed the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wanted. That's the difference between us and Billy Graham, quite honestly. It's allowing the Holy Spirit to have complete control. Bill Bright did even more than Billy Graham. People don't know that. Bill Bright brought the Jesus video to the world. I mean, I think uh, it, it, back when he died, there were probably... Um, six or seven billion people on the earth, three and a half billion people have seen the Jesus video. Did you know that? Tribes of nations all over the globe have watched the Jesus video in their native tongue. And millions upon millions of people have been saved because Bill Bright felt that the, 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 the sharing of the Jesus video, the story of Jesus, needed to be seen by people around the world and that they, if they saw who Jesus really is, they would believe. Now, this is interesting about Bill Bright. The man was as common. If, you, if he was in the room, you, you wouldn't point him out. There wouldn't be some special awe, this, ooh, who is that? Ooh, ah, ee. He's just a common man. I, I've met Bill Bright. I spent time with him. I was at an event with him. And I, there was nothing special about Bill Bright that way. But here's what Bill Bright shared with a group of us pastors privately when we said, Bill, God has used you greatly in the kingdom in your lifetime. What do you think the reason for that is? And uh, here's what he told us. That's real simple. When I, was, when I first married my wife, we sat down together and we wrote out a handwritten contract to God we, we desire, together, we desire to be slaves of Jesus Christ. We want to live a life of slavery to Christ. You have complete control of us. And they tried to live it out. So the great things that have happened through Bill Bright were not Bill Bright. It was that Bill Bright truly believed in a great God. And he submitted to a great God. So just to clarify that, because I think it's easy for us to think, boy, that person, wow, what an anointing. They have no more anointing than you have. It really is an indictment on yourself. Why aren't you like that? 
not the same, I mean not doing the same things, like somebody who can sing beautiful, heartfelt songs and we're just moved by their, their voice and by their heart. It's not just singing, it's something special in their, in their heart, you know, that comes out. Okay, well, you can't sing worth a ding-dong, okay? But there's other things that God has gifted you to do, and the same Holy Spirit wants to use you in a powerful way. And you're anointed. You're anointed. So getting that straight, but understanding that now, knowing that the Holy Spirit lives in us, the same Holy Spirit that lived in Saul and lived in David. Um, and, and isn't that interesting? Saul became wicked. Uh, people who are Christians can be, have wicked hearts too. We can fall back into the flesh. We can become carnal. But this thing about spiritual authority is very important, and it's not taught in the church today. And because of that, I think man takes matters into his own, own hands that don't belong to him. It's the Lord's work to do certain things, not man's work. And what we're called to do is obey God. And where God has made it clear who we are, what we are, what we're called to do, we should be faithful to that and not do anything else, not get caught up in trying to fix everybody else and do this and that and the other. Um, I'm going to take a subject, just one example. I could give you several. Uh, I could talk to you tonight about elders, the role of an elder, and the reason why the Scripture says, submit to those who lead you, obey those that lead you in Hebrews 7. Uh, I could go there. Uh, but I think tonight I'd, I'd like to go to a more sticky subject. I'm choosing the... I always told my kids, if you have a fork in the road, you can go either way, and both are good ways. It's not like one's good and one's evil. They're both good. Always take the tougher of the two because it'll force you to trust God more, and you'll learn more. Don't take the easy route. So I chose the tough route tonight. So here we go. The Apostle Paul addresses spiritual authority, but he addresses it as spiritual headship that God has designed for man to carry the role as spiritual head, spiritual headship, in the home and in the life of the church. And today in the church, that is, in many circles, that is laughed at. It's mocked. It's ridiculed. Uh, there are two views that are held by Christians today. One is an egalitarian view, meaning that we're both equal. Men can do what women can do. Women can do what men can do. Therefore, and they use the passage that we're all the same at the foot of the cross where you know, you're neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We're all equal. Well, what's the context of that passage regarding our salvation? We are. We're all equal. Men don't get more Jesus than women. Women aren't saved more than men are. We're all saved equally, right? But that does not have anything to do with the role that God has given men and the role that God has given women in home and in church. And so I want you to take your Bible. And we're going to turn to a very uh, sticky subject, a very difficult passage that a lot of Christians struggle with. And it's going to reveal just how this spiritual authority that we need to understand that David practices here in the text with Saul, how hard it is for us to practice the same thing in our own lives. So if you'll take your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 through 15. And I want to say to you before I begin, I do not have an opinion on this subject. I, my opinion, if I had one, wouldn't matter. Opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. And before I lived on this earth, People had opinions. And while I'm living, I can have opinions. But after I'm gone, nobody will remember my opinion. Because opinion, our opinions should not matter. What matters is God's opinion, first and foremost. 
So Paul is, this is a subject that Paul addresses, and it's interesting that when he talks about human authority versus God's authority and submission to authority, he literally connects the dots all the way back to creation. So look at 1 Timothy 2 uh, and verse 11. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Now, doesn't that just thrill you ladies to read that passage? Doesn't that just warm your heart? You're like, praise God, hallelujah. What do you think if I stood up in a public setting and I read that text in this culture today? They would laugh me off the stage. Let me read it again. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. In other words, what Paul is saying, I'm going to break it down for you in the original language. <laughs> Women are not to be the public teachers when the church assembles. But neither are they to be shut out from the learning process. Those who take an egalitarian view, the other view is complementarian. And I'm a, I take that view, and I believe that our church takes that view. The, the complementarian view is that God has created men and women differently, but for the purpose of complementing one another. As men are not more spiritual. Men are not more creative. Men are not more... We're all equal in terms of our spiritual salvation, in terms of the work of the Spirit. He can work in women like He can in men. But there are specific ways that I'm designed as a man to complement my wife and ways that she compliments me. She doesn't need to be like me. and I don't need to be like her. I don't need to change my gender. She doesn't need to change her gender. It's totally different than what we see today. And here Paul addresses this. He says, let a woman learn. Now, the view of the egalitarian, they will say to you, well, when Paul wrote these things that he's going to write, that we're going to speak about tonight, Paul is, he's, he's simply reflecting the culture of the day that he lived in. In that culture, in the Greek and Roman culture, women were looked down upon, and so Paul is just reflecting the culture. That's why he would say, don't let a woman teach. That's why he would say the woman should keep quiet, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that is not, they're not being totally honest with the text when they say that. First of all, uh, in that day, the culture said a woman wasn't allowed to sit in church and learn. So Paul's breaking the rules right there. Culturally speaking, he's saying, I'm telling you, because this is an a, a, a imperative verb, I want the women, I command you to let them learn. Let them learn. They have every right to be there. And, and so Paul's already moving beyond the culture. Uh, but understand also, he goes further, let a woman learn quietly and, su and, and with all submiss submissiveness. The word submission or submissive, hupotasso, it, it speaks of submitting to. It, means, it doesn't mean be lorded over. It doesn't mean you're a slave. It literally means to line up under. A child should come under the, the protection of the parents. God has designed men and women where a woman is to find a sense of shelter, protection under her husband. Come under that. Don't try to, to uh, rise up and be equal in headship. God never gave the position of headship to women. Don't try and overpower the husband. Now, just as I say that, I also need to say there's too many men today who have abdicated the role God gave them. And there's a reason why the women have stepped up, because the man is not walking with God and fulfilling the role of headship that God's given him. So there's a lot of issues that, that are reasons why there's perversion today of this this. Uh, this passage, but Paul is there saying uh, with quietly and with all submissive, uh, sub submissiveness. Um, 
He explains his meaning in verse 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise, here it is, exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. The Greek word for permit is used in the New Testament to refer to allowing someone to do what he desires. When someone's permitted, they're doing what they desire to do. There is a desire in the woman to rise up and not be under, to line up under. But he says, I don't permit that desire. This is in the life of the church. He says, I don't permit a woman to be a teacher over men in the church. By the way, the role of elder, pastor, teacher in the Bible, you hear those three words. The one you hear the least about is pastor. It's only mentioned a couple times in all the New Testament. You hear a lot about elder, a lot about teacher. They all mean the same thing. And, and uh, uh, the, it's an overseer, someone who's over. Again, others coming under. So a, a pastor or a teacher is over those who are under his teaching. That's the biblical position there. When he says, I do not permit a woman to teach, Paul used a verbal form of the Greek word that better indicates a condition or a process than anything else. What he's basically saying is, I don't permit a woman to be a teacher. That would be the better rendering in the text. But teacher in what way? Teacher over men. Not that she doesn't have the gift of teaching. Not that she doesn't have a, a calling to teach. Just not over men. But let women teach. Women over children. Women over other women. So he's not, he's not ruling out a woman's ability. He's just saying, let's respect this position of headship that God has created. That if we'll obey it and follow it, it'll work well for all of us. And, and so the kickback from an egalitarian will be, yeah, but no, it was about the day that they lived in. That's why Paul's addressing this. Well, I got to tell you, I disagree. Totally disagree. Uh, this, this whole passage deeply offends liberal theologians, mostly because they hide behind the excuse that Paul was only saying this because of the cultural norms in that society. But it was actually worse than just allowing women to speak publicly. She wasn't even allowed to sit with the men at the public square. Women were, I mean, they were, whatever women feel today, they were completely denigrated. Women were put down in every way. Paul's saying, give them a place. They've been saved. The same salvation that you've received, the same spirit lives in them. Now, we're not going to violate the roles of a man and a woman that God laid out, but the woman belongs. So Paul's actually, he's breaking all the cultural barriers. Verse 13, so why would Paul say? They say it's because of the custom of the day. Look at this with me now. This is very interesting. What is Paul's reasoning for saying that a woman should uh, remain quiet and submissive and not teach, not be a teacher over men in the church? Why? Verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. What's Paul's defense for his position? He goes all the way back to creation. Paul's not saying these things regarding women and their role because of the culture of the day. He's saying this is the way it was in the beginning. And interestingly, he's not referring to after the fall of man that this became the position. This was the position from the beginning, before the fall. What did he say? For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Okay, so this chauvinistic corruption of God's perfect design of man and woman that we see with men, uh, that did taint everything. But before any of that happened, before Adam fell, Eve was to be under, hupotasso, come under his leadership. Paul's bringing that point out. And verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now, let me just say to you, that doesn't mean that a man cannot be deceived. He's simply pointing out that a role that God gave 
Adam was to lead his wife in the Lord. And the role that he gave Eve was to come under in a complementarian way. What, she was made as a helper suitable for him. But she chose to rise above that role, and she's the one who committed the first sin in that she was the one that came back and led him. First of all, she sinned. Secondly, he let her lead. He joined her in the sin. So both of them sinned. Let's just make that clear. He's not better than her. But Paul is making the point that this is the way it was before the fall. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Understanding that passage, it does not mean that a woman is saved by giving birth to a child or that if you keep giving birth, keep having babies, that you'll be saved. That has nothing to do with it. He's saying that when you fulfill the role, it puts you back in a right position, a right place, that you can, God can use that to show you how meaningful, how important your role is, the role that he's given you. And I'm going to tell you right now, I, it, it grieves my spirit the way motherhood is put down in this society. It grieves my spirit. I have watched my wife with my children. I couldn't give the energy and time to my kids that my wife has given. She's wired to do it. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not casting on, ah, eh, she can do it. No, she needs my compliment. She needs my help. I need to be fully engaged when I'm in the room. But I'm, what I'm saying to you is this. There is something in a woman in parenting a man doesn't possess. She's gifted. It's, it's, it's the way God's wired her. And that's the, if you notice, that's the very thing Satan attacks today. He makes it look like that's so irrelevant, that's, that's a weakness in you. Look at the, the, if you look at all the liberal thought today, how it diminishes the roles that God has given. By the way, too, look at the man today. Where are the fathers? I read an article today, I think it was Fox News, an article that uh, they were talking about how in culture today, uh, fathers, they are, we don't need fathers. It's basically what the world is saying. They're a waste. Who needs a father? 80% now of all children raised in an inner city in the United States of America does not have a father image in the home. 80%. That's not a color thing. That's, all, that's including all children raised in the inner city. 80% don't have a dad. And, and there are those today who, who are fine with that. In fact, they accept it as that's the way it ought to be. So against what God's created. So, uh, looking further, the fall actually corroborates God's divine plan of creation. By nature, Eve was not suited to assume the position of spiritual headship over Adam, but she chose to leave Adam's protection and usurp his headship, and, and, by, do, and by doing so, she was vulnerable and fell, which confirms how important it was for her to stay under the protective leadership of her husband. And then Adam, he violates the role that God gave him and allows Eve to lead him. But interestingly, who sinned first? Who led them in sin? Eve. But when God shows up in the garden, remember, he came looking for Adam. Uh, and uh, they had, of course, clothed themselves or with, with fig leaves. And they're hiding from God. Adam, where are you? He didn't say Eve. When, when he spoke directly and said, what have you done? Who did he address? Adam. Adam will give an account. Men will give an account for whether they fulfilled God's role of headship in a loving, godly way. See, what I'm talking about is not a man lording over his wife. My wife and I discuss all decisions together. I want her feedback. Oftentimes, she has greater, oftentimes, greater insight than I have on a matter. But here's what my wife knows. In the end, whatever decision we make, you're going to answer before God first and foremost for it. So she comes under 
that final decision that God has given to me to make. But I don't make decisions apart from my wife. And oftentimes what she says leads me to a particular direction that I wasn't heading in. So there's that respect, you see? And I think it's important. Now, so Adam violates, Eve violates, and here's the point. Write this down if you will. This is a very important thing. We're talking about spiritual headship. We're talking about spiritual authority. Today in this society, nobody respects authority. Look at the legal system. Look at, the, look at our law enforcement. This Sunday, we're going to celebrate law enforcement. It's Law Enforcement Sunday. The American Family Association has asked all churches to recognize law enforcement on Sunday. We're going to do that. That's important to us because the law enforcement's not respected today. It's ridiculous. So, so get this, write it down. Whenever we take a God-given role and fulfill it in a God-forbidden way, it produces a God-forsaken uh, result. Whenever we take a God-given role and fulfill it in a God-forbidden way, it produces a God-forsaken result. And let me tell you the pathology of that. So God's told us clearly what is his desire. He's given us God-given roles. Satan is the one who came to Eve. The reason why God doesn't want you to eat of this tree is because if you eat of it, you will be like God. He tempted her to step out of her role and to assume a role as God. And Adam went along with her, taking a God-given role, fulfilling it in a God-forbidden way, and all that can come out of that is a God-forsaken result. Respecting God's authority and respecting the earthly authority that God has placed over us is crucial. When we ignore it or rebel against it, it ends poorly for us and for others around us. Those in authority are generally there for our protection, not to harm us. Does that mean that all who are in authority are, are, are good? No. Was Saul good? But he's absolutely in authority. And David said, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I won't do it. Okay? And I want to tell you why. This is why David said, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. He's essentially saying this, listen, it wasn't my place to touch God's anointed because Saul, listen, is the anointed instrument of God to stretch me, to change me, to make me the man that God intends me to be. The reason I should never touch Saul, who's in authority, because he's a wicked authority, is because God's using that wicked authority to challenge me, grow me, and change me. If you touch that person who's over you in authority that's, that's unhealthy or that is wicked, it could be that you are messing with God's plan for you because he was using them. Let me put this in a practical sense for you because sometimes we struggle with what I just said. It doesn't make sense, okay? I want you to think about our brothers and sisters in China right now. I want you to think about the brothers and sisters in Christ who live in North Korea, who are under a dictator who despises Christianity. And if he knows that they are a believer, he will literally have them killed in a very sacrificial way in public. Uh, we know that uh, Open Doors USA has recorded that Christians have been laid out on pavement and a steamroller roll them in public. Yet those Christians who are under this type of wicked authority, if you look at the life of those Christians, if you ever had the opportunity to meet them, they are so far ahead of us in their spiritual maturity, it's not even funny. Going into uh, Bhutan, that's how they pronounce it, Bhutan, um, which is a 100% Buddhist nation. If you're a Christian, you disappear. The government either puts you in a prison camp or they kill you. And we snuck over the border at night 
from India, northern India, went into Bhutan late at night, crossed the border, didn't have to go more than two blocks in to this village that was on the border inside, and it's a walled, it's all walled. You can't get into Bhutan without going through the, the, the soldiers and their immigration system. And there's a Christian who is, was in the immigration system who at night, very late, we all laid down in the bus, the, the Americans that were in the bus, and he let us cross into Bhutan. So we went maybe a block in and down this street, dirt, dirt road, and came to a little hut. There was a fire out front on the dirt and a, a child and a woman sitting at the fire, and they were cooking. And this is probably 10 o'clock at night, 9.30, 10 o'clock. When we pulled in, the, they, the lights were off in the, in the house, the lights were off on the trucks coming in. We never even turned the lights on. And we climbed out and immediately went into her, her little hut. And she came in behind us and put on a prayer shawl over her, to cover her head. And she said in that language to our guide, we must pray. Didn't have time. She had such a, a glow, uh, a smile, a warmth, but no time for small talk. We must pray. And this woman couldn't have been older than 25, 26 years old. We prayed with her, prayed for her, for the church in Bhutan. We got back on the bus and got out before they could come to her house, see what she was doing and whatever. Um, she risked her life to allow us to experience Bhutan and to pray with her. And a uh, young woman that's so far ahead of most of us in what she deals with on a daily basis under wicked authority. God uses wicked authority. We don't have a right to just come in and take over. Um, I'm thankful that we have a government where we have elections. Um, but when the election is over, uh, we need to submit to whatever God allows. And God will use it. How do you know God didn't allow things to play out the way they did this year? Because it's time to really wake up the church in America. I don't know. I'm not telling you what I, God, I'm, I'm not a prophet. I don't know. I'm just telling you this whole idea that as a Christian, you're supposed to be blessed every day and that you are going to, you know, your, your finances are going to advance and you're going to be raised up in your business and this is going to get better and better. And we have so many of those preachers out there today. That is such a different picture than what scripture shows us. And it's a different picture than what those around the globe who know the Lord and love the Lord deeply are experiencing. Why would we ever think that God's doing that in America when we put more babies to death than any other nation? So this is what David, this is what bothered David. That is a true man of God. That's why David had a heart after God. He knew I don't have a right to touch the Lord's anointed. That's not my position. I reached for my phone because mine went off earlier uh, before class. Verse 7, so David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So that's interesting to me. David did not only, uh, he didn't only keep himself from taking vengeance upon Saul. He also restrained his men. Now listen, many a man in that situation would have said, well, I'm not going to kill Saul, but I can't, I can't control what other people do. You just signed off on the king being killed when you say that. David said, not only will I not do it, I'm going to persuade my men not to do it. They were under his authority. And he said, just as I submit to the king, you need to submit to the king. That is a godly man. Afterward, David rose, also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul. So Saul left the cave first, not knowing David was deeper in the cave. Saul's going out of the cave, and he's ready to go back to his men. And, and David comes out of the cave behind him, and yells at him. So he's within yelling distance. 
And, uh, and this is really interesting to me. Uh, he said, my Lord, the king. My Lord, the one that's trying to kill you, the one that's throwing spears at you? Yeah, he's still his Lord. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. Was he honoring a wickedness in the king? No, he was not. He's honoring God's authority that Saul is the king. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for the, by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. Verse 12, may the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. If the Lord is going to right a wrong that someone has committed, it'll be the Lord doing it, not you. That's what David's saying. So David's, uh, well, he goes further. After whom has the... Uh, yeah, after whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. May God do the delivering here, not me. Because if God still wants you to come after me, obviously God has some things he wants to teach me. So I'm not going to touch you. Listen, friends. This is our opportunity to look at our problems, to look at our setbacks, to look at our ad adversaries differently. And I, I, it's just amazing to me. I was on the phone earlier tonight with someone who's going through a difficulty. And, and, and I said to them, but okay, you want uh, justice, but maybe the Lord's using the inequities to do something in you. The easy thing is for us to what? Point the finger at the wrongdoer. They betrayed me. I was nothing but a friend of them. They turned on me. But what's the Lord saying to you? Is he saying keep pointing at them? No, he's saying, why don't you let me use the pain and the setback in your life to, to change you, to grow you? So, David's insights into the Lord, his dependence on the Lord, his passion for the Lord, those reveal just how much David's heart is for God. And the Psalms are where you'll find David literally writing psalms or songs in this experience. He was giving God praise for using Saul in his life. It's pretty awesome. The same is true with us. Lord, change me. In the midst of this trial, in the midst of this unfairness that I'm facing, in the midst of the uh, un ungodly rulership over me at work or whatever, Lord, change me. Use it to do a work in me. That's what our brothers and sisters in these countries that are under oppression, that's what they're praying. And God's changing them to where they have a joy in the midst of a sorrow that you and I would only lay around all day long and pity for ourselves. They don't. They find joy in the Lord, even in those settings. So that's, that's what it should be for us. I'm tired of the smallness of my soul. I'm tired of the hardness of my heart. I'm tired of the pettiness of my flesh. Lord, make me different than I currently am. Do a work in me. Use the pain. Use the sorrow. I'll send you uh, everything I have. I'll give to you. I'll surrender to you. And so we pray that, and the Lord says, okay, wonderful. I'm going to do that, what you've requested. And we think, wonderful. He's going to send me this anointed, sweet, little, precious saint that's going to love me and tenderly help me through my difficult time and comfort me. And the Lord sends you a Saul instead.
Why are you special? He did it to David, the king of Israel. He sends a Saul, someone who comes with a tendency to fly off the handle and throw spears, someone who calls you names and uses manipulation for personal gain at your expense, someone who has deep insecurity issues, who only thinks of self-protection and preservation, who is threatened by your very existence every day at work. God says, that's, that's, I'm answering your prayer to be conformed to the image of Jesus. This is how we're going to do it. So who has the Lord allowed to be in your life who throws spears at you? Who has the Lord allowed to be in your life who's so insecure that they're always having to put you down to make themselves look better and feel better? Who is it? Who's in your life? Who, who is God using as an instrument to strengthen, to chip away at the hard areas, to hone you into a person that God truly can use and who brings glory to Christ. There really isn't another way for us to change in these difficult areas. I love what A.W. Tozer once said. He said, the Lord cannot use a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. That goes for women too. He can't use you greatly until he wounds you deeply. That's not the kind of stuff you're going to hear from a, you know, a modern sermon where it's all about what you can do and what you can be. And This is the real stuff, though. The question is, what will you do when Saul shows up in your life? Will you cut the, the zeet zeet of his garment, or will you go for his juggler vein? Will you allow God to use him or her in your life? to do a deeper work, or will you make it about them only? Complain, bellyache, and try to get even. I doubt that the blind man in John 9, I doubt that he really, when he came to Jesus asking to be able to see, I doubt that he thought Jesus would literally spit on the ground, make mud with his spittle, and then take the mud and put it in his eye sockets. God did make us Men from the dust of the ground, Jesus, I think, formed eyeballs with mud. Now, we don't know that to be true. I'm not, that's not scripture. I, but the man could see after. See, the very thing that we think God would do when he comes near to us oftentimes is the opposite of what he does. But here's the difference between a person who responds well to that and somebody who, who rejects that. It's called uh, desperation. When you're desperate, you'll let God do whatever he has to do. You ever notice a desperate person doesn't make demands? If somebody's been out at sea wandering for a week and they're about to die and the suddenly the, the Coast Guard shows up and they hand that person a little piece of bread, the guy doesn't go, what, what kind of bread is that anyway? How long has that been on the ship? <laughs> Just give me whatever you want to give me. I'll, I'll take it. That's the heart of David. That ought to be our heart with God. Lord, I'm desperate for you. If you want to make spittle or make mud with spittle and throw it in my eyes, if you want to tell me to go wash in the Jordan River that's filthy seven times, whatever it is, I'll do it. I'll do it. If you're going to tell me to go grab all the empty vessels and take the little jar of oil that I have left in my cabinet and go and gather all the empty jars and then just pour out that little thing into these vessels, that doesn't make any sense to me and I've got to go to my friends and i got to ask them for their empty jars. They're going to ask, why am I asking? And I've got to explain I'm absolutely broke. And the creditors are coming to take my two. It's embarrassing. But if that's what it takes, Lord, I'll do it. That's what the Lord looks for in us. The same heart as David. We're not demanding. Didn't Paul say that as a Christian you don't have rights? I think he said that. I think in Galatians 2, 20, I, somewhere in there, he said uh, what? Let's just turn there real quick. Yeah. 
Amen. Let, let, turn there. Turn to Galatians 2.20 real quick. Whoever gets there first, read it for us. Okay, I'm there. Um, <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ. Marine shared that with us. It is no longer I who live. If you don't live, what rights do you have? But Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul no longer claimed to have his own personal rights. See, people who claim rights all the time, they're, they're just miserable people. When you surrender to God and you say, Lord, my rights are your rights. Whatever you want, that's what I want. Life is simpler. And you're able to be used of God and you're able to grow, mature, in ways that you wouldn't if you're worried about your rights all day long. There's times, oh, look, I'm glad that I'm American. I have, I have rights as a United States citizen. I'm thankful for that. I'm not against that. But quite honestly, the bottom line, I'm a Christian. If you cut me, I don't bleed American. I bleed Christ. He's the only one that died on the cross for me, right? And so what does he say? You don't have rights. I'm your Lord. You are my slave. Just pull your oar well in the bottom of the ship. Do what I've called you to do and watch me move in your life. Watch me grow you. Watch others around you glorify God because you're simply walking with me. So as soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, look at this, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt, with, uh, dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, he will let him go away safe. Will he let him go away safe? No way. So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up into the, uh, to the stronghold. Now, here's what I want to say about that. That is so beautiful that Saul repented. Saul seemed to get right with David, and he confessed his own sin. That's wonderful. Here's the problem. Even though Saul is, I believe, being sincere, even though he has great intentions, the problem is he's still in his flesh. Lots of people make promises of reformation. They attend 12-step programs. You know, they, they go to church more regularly. They go see a counselor. You know, they're going to hit the clinic more often, whatever it is. Uh, they'll write inspiring poems, and they'll do all these good things. But oftentimes they fall back into, and here's why it didn't work, because they were trying to reform. And what man needs today is not more reformation, which is what we seem as a nation to try to provide man. Let's just give them more programs for reformation, for reform. They don't need reform. They need regeneration. They need to die to flesh and live in the Spirit by Christ. You got to die before you really live with God. And so, as long as that person's not died, doing good things and reforming only lasts so long. It does not save you, it does not deliver you, it does not change you ultimately. What changes you is when you are born again. The biggest problem in our inner city is not some pro that we need more programs for children who don't have a dad. The biggest thing is for God to do a work in the moms and the dads in the inner city and save them from sin. Believe me, when you get right with God, other things start falling into place. Make sense? And so that's where we're going to end tonight. Um, what, what does Mark say in the Gospel of Mark? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is... I think Paul, true, or Saul, really wanted, he meant what he said, but his, his flesh is going to show up again. The spirit in him is missing.
because he didn't he wasn't regenerated. He's just reforming. Uh, so that's that's where we leave it tonight. I hope that tonight the Lord's used this time to maybe reveal some things to you. I'll tell you this. I don't know what he's saying to you, but boy, he worked me over in my preparation for this teaching. Worked me over. He took me on a journey in my role as a head in my home and in the church. That am I, am I a faithful servant of God and do I model what it looks like for someone to submit to the Lord? Because that's what you need to see from me. That's what my wife and my kids need to see in me. That's what it's about. It's about submission. Uh, Watchman Nee once said, no man has earned the right to be in a position of authority until he's learned to submit to authority. And I want to be that kind of a shepherd leader that I am fully submitted to God. I don't want to give uh, you any reason to not submit to the Lord. And I want to do the same in my home. That's, that's where I'm at. I don't know how God would use this in your life, but I pray that tonight, by the word of God, he would strengthen you, he would, he would bless you, he would encourage your heart. Father, as we close our time, we do give you thanks for your word. We pray that tonight the opinion that was heard is, was your opinion, that your teaching was heard, not man's teaching. And I pray that, Lord, we would all find our place and we would fulfill our role as men, as women, that we would understand who you are and what you have given us, how blessed we are to be saved from the foundation of the world. What a blessing. And that you have everything covered as a sovereign God. So we leave tonight with absolute confidence in the one true living God. And we pray that you will continue to use whatever, whether it be a positive, godly example of authority or whether it be someone who is dysfunctional in their authority. Use them, Lord, to change us. In Jesus' name, amen.